Well, good morning, church. Isn't it wonderful to see the house of God full? Correct answer to that question is amen. amen. All right. We're glad you're here. Glad we can be together. Some people think that marriage is a three-ring circus. First there's the engagement ring, then there's the wedding ring, and then there's the suffering. <laughs> of course, we don't think that way, do we? Careful, careful how you answer that. There's a marriage counselor one time who was uh, listening to a couple as they explained their problem, their conflicts, and after he listened for a while, he attempted to offer some hope to what they thought were irreconcilable differences. He leaned forward and he said, the problem that you seem to have here is that you're both overreacting to minor problems. I know how you feel though. I had the same problem with my third wife. <laughs> now we may chuckle at that, and we may not. But it reminds us, doesn't it, that uh, there's a really important question. Who do we listen to? Who do we pay attention to for marriage advice? And who are the experts that we consult? There are all kinds of people out there offering it that we could potentially listen to. You know, there are famous talk show hosts and celebrities and authors and columnists and so forth. And, you know, you could watch a TV show and, and take a marriage and family lessons from it. A lot of times, listening to those sources makes about as much sense as the listening to the counselor and the bad joke I told a moment ago. Well, let's turn to the Bible this morning. Uh, we started last week a little series of messages from Genesis chapter 24, which we entitled Biblical Family Planning. And, and we noticed last week that it's sure a lot different than any family planning our world offers today. But it is Bible, and, and so we believe it's true with a capital T. Last week, we, we studied how biblical family planning starts early, long before a child is ever thought of. We start our planning. And that, and that also it seeks to build and to find spiritual, godly relationships. Now, Genesis chapter 24, again, is the story of the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah. And last week, we sort of focused on Father Abraham's role in all of this as he sought to find a good wife for his 40-year-old single son, Isaac. That was of vital importance because all the blessings and promises of God were to come through this child of promise, Isaac. He was sort of the funnel through which God was going to pour his blessings into this family and eventually into all of us. And so Abraham chooses his servant and sends him back to his homeland, which is Mesopotamia, to find a spiritual woman for Isaac to marry. And today we're going to pick up the story with that servant who has made this 500 mile trip uh, from Canaan to Nahor. And now he finds himself at a well there. And he is praying for guidance in his search. Now his search is about to bear fruit. And we're going to look at that, but first, I want to give you what I think is the major point for our message this morning from Genesis 24. Here it is. A strong, long-lasting marriage begins with me being the right person. Okay? It begins with me being the right person. And that, that's sort of where it begins and ends. And, and I have to be the right person, you see, for marriage to work. 
You know, we often joke about, about finding Mr. Right, right? Um, heard some wise advice about that one time. If you're looking for Mr. Right or Mrs. Right, whatever the case may be, just make sure their first name is not always. I'll give you some time on that one. <laughs> always right. Um, there was a guy who, who said the following. He said, when I was a young man, I vowed I would never marry until I found the ideal woman. Well, I found her. But alas, she was waiting for the ideal man. Well, it's true. So you see, we're not talking about perfection here in what we're, we're projecting. We're not looking for or expecting a perfect person because we are not perfect people. But we have to realize that success in a, a marriage and a family relationship starts with me being the right person. So let's illustrate it by looking at, at this story this morning, another part of it. I'm just going to read some verses together beginning at verse uh, 10 of Genesis 24. Let's see what happens in this. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of, of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when the women go out to draw water. And he said... O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I, I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink and who shall say, drink and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Well, we have this servant uh, of Abraham after a long trip. He's at this well outside the city of Nahor in Mesopotamia. He's no, no doubt hot and sweaty and thirsty. And he has about 10 camels with him that are also hot and thirsty. And he prays that God will guide him to the right woman for Isaac, his master's son. So let's, let's look and see what happened. Continuing verse 15. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water. And she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. Well, in fact, the Lord had prospered his journey. Rebecca, this woman who appears here, would be Isaac's wife. There would be a marriage and, and a su successful one. And, and later on, there would be children. And God's blessings would continue to flow. And a big part of the reason why was that Rebecca was the right person to begin with. She was the right person. 
Not claiming she was a perfect person, but she was the right person. It all starts by being the right person yourself. And Rebecca was. But how did she show it? How did she show she was the right person? Well, look again at what she does here. She offers the servant a drink after he asks. And I, I guess we would all agree that's nice. That's kind. Uh, but did it really take a lot to do that? Probably not. Um, it, it's, it's kindness. It shows some concern. Maybe we might say some hospitality. But I want you to look at what else happens. She offers to water his camels as well. Now, we might think, big deal. Right? Just, just get a big dish and fill it up and let them drink, right? But we don't know our camels very well, if that's what we're thinking. Do you realize what it takes to water a camel after a long trip like this? There are 10 camels in this train. It is said that your average camel can hold at least 20 gallons of water. 20 gallons. Now let's do a little math. 20 gallons times 10 camels. Uh, didn't bring my calculator, but I think it's about 200 gallons. wonder how big that jar was that, that Rebecca was carrying. Well, I, I sort of think of our, our walk for water. How, how big is the, the thing we carry? Is it five? Five gallons. Okay, I, I imagine this, this thing might be that big, five gallons. How many trips would it take her to re retrieve 200 gallons of water for those camels? Well, if you're a math whiz, you might calculate 40 trips. How long does each trip take, I wonder? Back and forth, back and forth, I don't really know. Uh, how long does it take to fill a, a five-gallon jar from an ancient well? Let's, let's be conservative here and, and say maybe it took three minutes a trip. Forty trips. At three minutes a trip, that comes to more than two hours of work, folks. Two hours of extra work for a total stranger when all he asked for was a drink for him. She volunteers the rest, you see. And you know what happened after those estimated two hours? Let's look on and see. Verse 22. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring, weighing half shekel, and two bracelets for her arms, weighing ten gold shekels, and said, Please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, we have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord and said, blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master as for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsman. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. Rebecca continued to demonstrate she was the right person by showing more hospitality. And so the servant knows that his mission has been Successful, he sort of struck gold. He's found the one who will marry his master's son. Why? Because she was the right person. Why was she the right person? Because she proved herself to be a true servant. She went the extra mile. She did more than what was asked. 
That, more than anything else, revealed her heart. That revealed why she was Mrs. Wright for Isaac. Again, the point is, is pretty simple this morning, folks. Uh, and it is that a strong, happy, long-lasting marriage begins with me being the right person. And that begins before I get married, right? And it certainly doesn't end with my saying, I do. You know, it's not like the woman who bragged. She said, uh, my husband and I have a very happy marriage. There's nothing I wouldn't do for him. There's nothing he wouldn't do for me. And that's the way we go through life, doing nothing for each other. That's not, the, that's not what we're talking about. That won't last, will it? That will not last. I like the wisdom that uh, Joyce Brothers shared one time. You may, many here may need, not even know that name. But she's credited with saying one time, quote, Marriage is not just spiritual communion and passionate embraces. Marriage is also three meals a day and remembering to carry the garbage out. Pointing out the importance, again, of being the right kind of person and serving, serving one another. Rebecca was the right person first. And then she became the right wife for Isaac. She was a spiritual servant. She did more than she was asked. She did more than was expected. And friends, that is godly living. Don't you get tired sometimes in our rights-worshipping society of hearing people all the time proclaiming what they're not going to do? No. I'm not going to do that. I don't do windows. That's not my job. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I get sick of hearing that. Don't you? I just don't think it's very godly to proclaim what we're not going to do. You may have heard this before, but imagine what the world would be like if if, if Michelangelo had said, I don't do ceilings. Or if Noah had said, I don't, I don't do boats. Or if Moses had said, I don't do deserts. Or if David had said, I don't do giants. What if Mary had said, I, I don't do virgin births. Or John the Baptist had said, I don't pave the way for anybody else. Or what if Peter had said with finality, if he had said, I don't work with Gentiles. Or Paul had said, I don't write letters. What if Jesus had said, I don't do crosses. And it all comes back to Jesus, really. Being like him makes me the right person for my situation, for my marriage. I could give you all kinds of research and studies and experts' advice. I could give you 10 points for a successful marriage that somebody came up with. All kinds of specific steps and behaviors and things to do but it, if it doesn't begin with being the right person in Jesus Christ, if we don't start there, then we're immediately off on the wrong foot. Rebecca is a great example of this. But the greatest example of all is Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be 
grasped, held on to, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. And he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Philippians chapter 2. There's the one that we really learn from. There's our expert. And the one that will make us the right person. So I want to close with Jesus. I want to close with the offer of the gospel. Where we can be forgiven, as Landon reminded us so well this morning. Where we can become the right person in Christ. Yeah, we can be perfect. Because we take on his perfection. I hope in your life you have done that. That you have gotten into Christ. That you are currently in Christ. If so, you are ready uh, not only for great relationships here. But an eternity with God. And uh, you know when we think today of our brother who's now gone to his reward. Brother Gene. Why do we think so fondly? Because when we looked at him. He reminded us of Jesus. Today, if you need to make a change in some way, we give you a time to come and respond, and we'll pray with you, do whatever we can to support you and assist you as you become more like the Lord. Let us stand. Let us sing.